What I'd like to do today is read verses 1 through 8. That's our text today in this third chapter of this little itty-bitty book in the New Testament uh, from the New Living. And we'll pray after that. But today what we're going to see is that there's kind of one main point in this cluster of verses, verses 1 through 8. But then three points of focus for that singular point. There's one main point, but then three kind of points that bring focus to that main point. And here's what we'll see. The main point that Paul is encouraging, exhorting Titus to as a leader is to remind the people. Remind them, he tells them over and over. Well, remind them to do what? Well, verses 1 and 2, of what to do. Then in verse 3, who we were. And then in verse 4, through the end of our time together, what God has done. Remind them. That's the singular point today. Remind them. Remind them of what? What to do. Who they were. And what God has done. Let's read it. We'll pray. And then we'll look at what it means to remind them. Verse 1. Remind the believers to submit to the government and to its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. Verse 2. They must not slander anyone, but must avoid quarreling. Or you could just insert Facebook. I mean, avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone. Once, too, we were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy. We hated each other. Wow. Verse 4. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, he generously poured out his spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. You see, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial to everyone. Lord, I think everyone in this room and Another room through our online connection qualifies as an everyone. And Lord, you say in your word that this this teaching is good and beneficial for everyone. The words that we see here in Titus chapter 3. So Lord, may they not be lost on us today. As life is very full and seems to just quicken its pace day after month after year. I pray that this time would not be lost on us. Give us a moment, Lord, to to take in what you want to share. Give me the ability, I ask, Lord, and humility to to, to serve people well today. Lord, that they may, may see you in Scripture. Holy Spirit, have full freedom and, and focus of our heart. And Lord, as we leave here today, may we listen and learn so that we can love, live, and lead more like Jesus. I pray that in his name. Amen. Remind them. I love that who we are, and in fact, I would say it this way more more appropriately, whose we are. Who we are and whose we are always comes in Scripture before we're concerned with what to do and how to do it. Who we belong to is the priority before what we should be doing in Scripture. Orthodoxy comes before orthopraxy, one person would say. 
You say, what do you mean by that? Well, here's what I'd say. I'd say Titus chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, that text that we considered last week together, pairs really well with Titus chapter 3. The first verse in chapter 3 pairs really well with the two preceding verses in chapter 2 at the end, verse 14 and 15. Let me read them to you. I'll put them up on the screen. First in New Living, this is what Paul writes. Again, this is from Titus chapter 2, verse 14. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. You must teach these things, encourage the believers to do them. You have the authority to correct them when necessary, so don't let anyone disregard what you say. Now listen to it in more of a word-for-word, word, New King James speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke. Let no one despise you. Did you catch that? We are free. We're cleansed. We're his own people, we're redeemed, we're purified, we're zealous, and we're committed to good works. What does it look like to love like Jesus, to live like Jesus, to lead like Jesus? It's to know that you're free, that you're cleansed, that you belong to him. I'll share this story. I didn't intend to, but I'll change the names to protect the innocent. We had a young person in our life this week who did not want to eat their probiotics. Do you know what those are? Here's what she said. Oh, I gave you some indication. It's my body. Oh, I've heard that phrase. It's my body, it's my choice if I should put probiotics in my body. Oh, really? I said, okay, here's your assignment. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 and Ephesians 6, 1. Go read that and tell me what you should do. The individual came back and said, well, the Bible says it's not my body, for I have been bought at a price, and I should now glorify God with my body. And there's another that said, this is my body. And when that phrase is used, it has a tone to it that's very devilish. And she said, so it's not my body. Yeah, good. You got part one. What's part two? Ephesians 6.1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. <laughs> so I said, let me, let me ask you another question. Uh, we're going to eat these probiotics, right? Yes, we are. And I said, tell me why. Because I don't belong to me, and I am called to follow my leadership. She, she didn't put it that way, but that's what she wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so here's the reality. Identity comes before instruction. Promise precedes and undergirds commands. Understand that. I don't have to do it. Do you know who you are? Oh. You know, this, this book is actually intended to tell you what to do. I don't know if you know that. A lot of Americans say, don't tell me what to do. I didn't vote for that. Well, your, your vote doesn't matter when it comes to this. Um, we're under the authority of his word. Not above it. And so, one would put it this way. I don't know if we should talk about this, but another way to say this is the indicative always comes before the imperative. Imperatives are commands. Do this. But in grammar, the indicative mood is used to make an ordinary statement of fact. Because this is true, indicative, then this is how you should live. Imperative. I don't know if this is making sense. Identity comes before instruction. Promise precede commands. Indicative before imperative. See, he's going to give these commands in chapter 3, verse 1, that are command. Like, this is what we do. Because of all that God has done, and here's what we supernaturally do, because of his grace, not white-knuckling Christianity, not bootstrap Christianity and just pulling those laces, it's because of his grace, because life has been changed. 
So Paul tells us in verse 15, speak and teach these things. What does that mean? Well, the language there would indicate a casualness to it. Paul wanted Titus to infuse grace into every conversation. Is that the tone of the conversation of your home? Grace. Did you know that love actually covers a multitude of sins? That see, the conversation of who you are should have an element of grace to it. Chuck Smith was often accused when it came to staffing a church of being too gracious. You say, what do you mean by that? Oftentimes, he would give an individual a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth chance. And people would often accuse him of, Chuck, don't hire that person. Oh, and here's what he said. If I'm going to err, I would like to err on the side of grace. Because grace, it's his kindness that changes. That doesn't throw out logic. Please don't misunderstand. But this, this dynamic to speak and teach implies this casual speaking. Your lifestyle is infused with grace. But he also says exhort and encourage the language there is like a good coach. Like, hey, it's okay, be quiet. Like you're trying to coach them. You know, hey, it's okay. Exhort, encourage, grace must constantly be on our lips as a source of encouragement. And then he says, rebuke, correct, with all authority. Meaning, sometimes you have to toe the line. And you have to say like a, a teacher showing a student the right method to solving a problem. Now, this is how it's done. I'll share another example with you. One of my sons this week asked me, Dad, is it possible for you and I to take my kayak out to Crab Island? Sure, we can do that. I've got a paddleboard, you've got a kayak, let's do it. So I try to give him some instructions before we head out there. But here's what happens. As we begin to make our way to the island, that's not really an island anymore, but like jellyfish. I know this sounds hyperbolic, but you can ask him later. That looked like this, very big, all around the water. So we're paddling over to Crab Island, but here's the deal. His strength is not such that he can compete with the current to get past the dock to get out to Crab Island. I learned that. I did not know that before we got into the water. So there's jellies everywhere. The strength is not quite there. Kayak flips once or twice. And then the current takes him towards the dock. Now, it's not a water level dock. It has these pilings. So if he goes to it, he can go right underneath it. It's OK. But in the mind of a child, this is chaos. Water's pulling him. Jellyfish are everywhere. And we learned a lesson that day. I told him, you learned two. Here's the first lesson. The difference between panic and fear. I explained to him, hey, listen, there's nothing wrong with the healthy fear. I think it's the beginning of wisdom when it comes to God. A healthy respect, a healthy fear, a healthy recognition that, oh, this is a, this is a dynamic here. I should wake up. I should pay attention. But I said, panic is altogether different. Breathe. Kept saying this over and over. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Finally, he did. He hopped on the back of my board. Somehow I wrangled the kayak and the paddle and him and made it back to the shore. We did it. But we sat down on a bench thereafter and said, OK, there were two lessons here today. This is not a failure. You learned. You learned the difference between panic and fear. Do you understand the difference? I said, yes, I get it. And you also learned you need to listen to your leader. Because I said, buddy, you weren't listening. So you thought this, and you thought that, and you assumed this, and you, f but I just, hey, follow me. Fo he didn't listen. So I said, here's our next step. Next, we're going to get a leash that attaches you to me anytime we go anywhere. Because he lost his paddle. His paddle went down the, down the way. I said, you and I are going to have to go 50-50 on that paddle. 
because I bought it first, but you're going to help buy the second. Um, but we need to go in the deep end of a pool. You need to learn how to flip this thing over. And we need to do some push-ups, you know? So like, that way when that current comes. You say, why are you sharing this? As a teacher to a student, I had to give him clarity of the right way to do this. Why am I sharing this with you? Grace must permeate who you are as a believer. Chuck Smith used to say one of the most challenging things in life is to accept grace graciously and then to extend it. To be someone who, like we've read in Titus chapter 3, understands, please listen, please don't miss this, that you are cleansed. That you're free. That you have been forgiven. See, if you don't get that, that you're loved by God, and then you seek to go and live for God without a proper understanding that you're loved by God, please stop it. Because you'll become a religious militant that does not reflect the heart of God. You'll be a moralist, doing more damage than support in the name of Jesus. Know this. God loves you. You don't have to do anything to earn that. You're forgiven in him. You just surrendered. Today we'll celebrate that through communion. You need to know that because of the grace of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, you can have new life and be cleansed and be forgiven and set free. And Paul tells Titus, don't let anyone disregard you on this truth. And then he transitions into chapter 3, verse 1. Don't miss this. Don't miss the tone of grace as we get into chapter 3, verse 1. He says, remind them. This word remind is used 51 times in the New Testament. It speaks of patience. It speaks of endurance. It speaks of waiting continually. It, it speaks of remaining. Isn't that marriage? Isn't that being single? Isn't that being a student, a boss, or an employee? Reminding. This is the season I'm in. I need to focus that life, although is brief and not promised, is a more of a marathon than a sprint. I need to be reminded. As a pastor, or at least one who seeks to love Jesus and serve people, I understand this. I need to be reminded. Continually. Take it slow. You know, you want the person and the position and the place to align. You can have the right idea with the right people, but if it's the wrong time, it's wrong. You've got to be at the right pace with the Lord. We used to have an individual that served here on staff, sweetest man in the world. He did CCNI's premarital counseling, and he used to say this prayer, Lord, don't allow us to get ahead of you or to lag behind you, but just walk in step with you. Isn't that what the garden was supposed to be? To walk with him. Let me share this with you. Even in the midst of the presence of sin, where there is still cancer and death and sorrow and big jellyfish, the Lord wants to walk with you. But you must have an ear to hear. This is what he's saying. Remind them. The tone of this is this patient, enduring, continually. We need to be reminded, reminded, reminded. What do we need to be reminded of? Look at verse 1 and 2, seven things. Number one, be subject to the rulers and authorities. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 13. Let every person be subject to governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. I feel like that's pretty clear. We're not anarchists. We're not rebels. We don't subvert or disobey. In my opinion, we show respect to our governing leaders. But, 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 well, listen to this verse. 
Acts chapter 5, verse 29. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than men. When the government begins, the governing authorities, to demand something in direct violation of God's word. Let me, let me qualify that. Direct. Direct violation of God's word. Then I think Acts 5.29 matters. Do you know who Joni Erickson Tata is? I heard a quote from her this week that I thought was so helpful. She said, be careful of taking your strong opinion and attaching it to divine inspiration. She said, that is one of the most godless forms of persuasion. That's why it's really good to get to know this book. So you can have personal convictions. But as soon as you say, well, God's told me this. And you go, and I go, well, here it doesn't say that. So who's the authority? You hearing God or this? Now, does that mean that God can't speak to your heart and lead? And you say, hey, by faith, this is what I want to do. Oh, absolutely. Go that way. But to make these lines where you would say, this is my strong opinion. God's given me divine inspiration. It's just a sales tactic. That's called persuasion. The better you know this, the better you'll know how to do this. So don't you wish there was a church that every single day made a daily video so that you could get to know this? Because listen to me, there is no mediator between God and man. I'm not your mediator. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants you to know him intimately. To, to get to know this in a way that's vibrant and real. So that when one of your children comes up and says, I'm not taking probiotics. You go, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Ephesians 6, 1, bam, gotcha. You know, like, I didn't even have to get you. The word did it, you know, like. You just, you just know the Bible, you know, the better you know the Bible, the better you are. Does that make sense? Remind them what to do. Sub submit to your governing authorities. Number two, this, that's number one, be obedient. I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory. Number three, be ready to do every good work. What does it mean to be ready? Like you did it today. I'm going to church, getting ready. The word every is comprehensive, it kind of speaks of what Galatians 6 says. I'll put it on the screen. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to those we like, if we're affiliated with the same part. No, it doesn't say that. Let us do good to everyone, especially to those, though, who are of the household of faith. Make sure you take care of home team. Don't do things out there if you're not taking care of what's right here. Doesn't make sense. But we should be looking to, ready for, how can I help? How can I help? How can I assist? How can I serve? One example of this is in the area of being a giving people, a serving people. You guys evidence that very, very well every third Sunday of the month. We have a lady that I've known here for a long time named Miss Pat, and she's been very passionate about this food pantry that we've been doing for years. And the last time we did it, she goes, I just don't know what's going on. I was like, well, is that good or bad? She goes, we have so much food coming in every single time we ask. I said, that's because people love Jesus and they give. And that's you. A giving church. You see, we're called to be generous people because we have been given to. Let me ask you a question. Are you thankful that God gave his son for you? Yeah. So that's what motivates giving. That's all it is. That's simple. And it's not nearly enough to respond to what you see, to the people you interact with and the situations you're presented with, but we should be proactively going after good works, like a hungry lion looking for its prey, or a manic surfer jonesing to get in the water. Ever met anybody like that? Oh, where, where, where. That's what Christians should be like for good works. Where, 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 where can I serve? A hunter, when you hear the word open season, oh, I'm ready. Like, a fisherman, when they say they're biting, they're ready for that. 
or a little two-year-old looking for sugar. You ever met that person? They're ready for it. Where? Sugar? Where? Where? We should crave good works, but here's the reality. You and I have more than one thing in common, but here's one thing we share. We have an enemy. We deal with our flesh, and there's a world system all around us. Listen to, to 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to read this in two different translations. First one, New Living. Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. Listen to this. These are not from the Father, but of this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Same verses, different translation. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It's not of the Father, but of this world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who goes to, he who goes to church, he who does... The will of God abides forever. We have an enemy. We have the flesh. There's a world system. But listen to me. Integrity is the antidote to the lust of the flesh, passion, and sex. Outside of the confines of Scripture. Integrity is. That's the antidote. Generosity is the antidote to the lust of the eyes. Possession and salary. Humility, the antidote to the pride of life, position, and status. Passion, possession, position, status, salary, and sexual immorality are diffused by humility, generosity, and integrity. Can I share something with you? You can do those three things. Humility, you have a spouse that will help you with that. If you feel like, I'm not, I'm, well, let's talk to them. Generosity, you know what someone once told me? Neil, you want to build a healthy ministry? Well, I don't want to build an unhealthy one, so I guess find people that are hurting and help them. You'll never lack for something to do. You can be generous to those that are in need. There's a lot of them. Integrity, integer. Be the same. Be constant. You can do that. Will you fail? You will fall. But here's what it means to fail, to stop trying, and to try and do it alone. Statistics will tell you no one ever gets healthy alone. They only get healthy in groups sustainably. Oh, there's a community. There's small groups. There's gatherings. That's how you move forward. I read this from Our Daily Bread. Anyone ever read Our Daily Bread? Great little situation there. This is what they said regarding this dynamic of being a giving, serving people. The act of giving reminds us that we live by the grace of God. Like the birds and the flowers, those creations don't worry about their future, neither should we. Giving offers us a way to express our confidence that God will care for us just as he cares for the sparrow and for the lily. I love being in a third world context when there's a need. And the first go-to is not Lowe's.com, but it's prayer. I'll never forget that. I'm trying to help build a Baptist church in Northwest Haiti from the years 2007 to 2010. And the engineer there, the bulldozer broke one day and he said, okay, let's pray. We're putting hands on the bulldozer. And I thought, what, for the bulldozer? Okay, well, that's what we do. Um, it's hard to be alive when I'm looking to another source for provision than the author of life. And material possessions come and go. Your job is not your provision point. God is. 
But until you're free from that, well, I have to because this is how I provide, really. Hmm. Trust the Lord. Don't be foolish. I mean, have you ever read Proverbs? Like, don't be dumb. But also don't live an insulated life. Well, you're no longer walking by faith. You're seeking to walk by clarity, not faith. Thus, you're frustrated. It's a life of faith that produces life. Trust. Trust. We disarm the power of money by giving it away. We disarm the power of selfishness by serving. Does anyone like Uncle Scrooge? Isn't that what his name is? What's his name? Uncle Scrooge. That's the DuckTales version of Ebenezer Scrooge. That's what that is. Does anyone like Ebenezer? Not until he meets the three, you know, spirits, I guess. No, he's miserable, selfish, and lacks generosity. And life happens for that older man when he learns this lesson. I should make it about others. I should give this away. Welcome to life. Paul says, be submissive, be obedient, be ready for every good work. Then he shares four more things. To slander, speak no evil of no one. To be peaceable, meaning to avoid quarreling. To be considerate, meaning to be gentle. And to show perfect courtesy to all people. I don't know about you, but I love courteous people. You ever met courteous people? They open the door for you. They say hello. They're like, wow, you're just courteous. Show perfect courtesy to all people. Don't you think Gulf Breeze would look different if the few hundred people that are in this room this week said, that's my goal this week, courtesy to all. Wow. They'd go, who are you? I'm someone that's just seeking to love, live, and lead like Jesus by being courteous. Now, this is what he does. He reminds them of what to do. Submissiveness, obedience, being ready, no slander, peaceable, considerate, perfectly courteous. Now he reminds them who we were, who we were. If you look at verse 3 of chapter 3, he tells you, once we too were foolish and disobedient, we were misled, became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of envy, and we hated each other. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time there. That sounds pretty gnarly. But you can never really appreciate who you have become or what you have now without the constant reminder of where you could be. The old saying is true. You never really know what you have until it's gone. Aren't you thankful that your standing in Christ is not in question? You don't wake up with a capricious God of Islam who can change his mind. He loves me, he loves me not. That's the Islamic way. Not for the God of the universe. He loves you. Never going to change. He's forgiven you. He sets you free. Remind them of who we were. You never, I have never been there, but I have a friend that went, once went to England and saw the crown jewels. And he mentioned something, that when they present them, they don't just use any old light or any old backdrop. They don't like take a ruby and put it on a red cloth because then it wouldn't really sparkle like it could. But they put it on the black, you know, backdrop sometimes of like a diamond or something because then it sparkles. You know when the gospel most sparkles in your life? When you realize this is who I was in the muck and the mire before Christ. Gospel's good enough for me. I'm good on Monday. I got everything I need. Jesus has forgiven me. You've heard me say this before, but if you preach the gospel to yourself every single day, you were lost but found, guilty but forgiven. It's the best way to live. You've heard me say this, but you are the one who talks to yourself more than anyone else, right? So tell yourself the truth. This is who I was, but this is who I am. And it'll help you to celebrate who you are. Remind them of who they were, lost. Third and finally, remind them of what God has done. Now, for the sake of time, I'd like to just share, if I can, in an alliterated way, verse 4, 5, 6, and 7. We've read the text multiple times, but here's what God has done. 
Number one, it's in verse four. We see the evidence that God greatly cares for us. Don't you see that there? Verse four, when God, our savior revealed his, he cares for us. Listen, listen, don't, don't do this. Don't, don't, don't graduate from John three sixteen. Does that make sense? Oh, I heard that truth. That's Tim Tebow 10 years ago. I don't need to listen. No, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. If that doesn't change the way your face looks, something's wrong with you. God loves you. He gave himself for you. You don't have to live in H-E double hockey sticks. You get to be with him. And eternal life, this is a misnomer, to think that it speaks of a quantity of time. Eternal life speaks of a quality of time. Because you will live eternally one way or the other. How do you want it to be? Everything that's good in this world is because of God. Remove that. That's where that will be. But God has given. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his love for us. Finality, this language here, through the cross. Through the cross. Don't graduate from this. God cares for us. Number two, verse five, if you look at it there, he changes us. Washed away our sins. New birth, new life. He cares, he changes. Verse six, God has come for us in the power of the Holy Spirit. We now have an abiding personal relationship with Jesus because of the Holy Spirit. Rewind the clock back to the, the tabernacle days when there was one guy who could encounter the presence of God on one day a year. That's where we could be, but it's not. You can wake up before the sun rises, crack open your Bible and a cup of coffee and go, God, I'm here. I want to meet with you. See, we take that for granted because we've always had it. It's not so for the rest of the generations before us. He cares, he changes, he comes. And number four, he comforts us. Verse seven speaks to this. Because of his grace, he makes us right in his sight. He gives us confidence. He has saved us. We're heirs with the hope of eternal life. See, our future should bring great comfort. Our future. I am headed to heaven. What can you do with me? I'm headed to heaven. That comfort should lend itself to confidence. And Paul circles back to his main point in verse 8 where he says, this is a trustworthy saying. Four other times in these pastoral epistles, pastoral epistles are known as Timothy and Titus, he speaks of this. This is trustworthy. Keep coming back to this. This is solid. He wants to bring Titus back to the thrust of what he's saying. Titus, stress these things. Let it be in casual conversation. As a coach, encourage. As a teacher, hold the line. One author put it this way. Paul was deeply concerned that God's people devote themselves to doing what is good. That's the point. Like It should translate into action. Because these things are excellent and profitable for everyone, Titus was to promote good works, for they go hand in hand with sound doctrine. I once heard someone say this week, said Bible studies should not lead to more knowledge, but to better living. Well, don't misunderstand what he's saying. Yes, it should lead to knowledge. But a lot of people stop there. So if the study of God's word, if listening and learning to the scriptures doesn't translate to loving, living, and leading like Jesus, then you're probably a little loopy. You'll be a little lame, a little loco, a little lost. That's what I tell my kids every morning. All those L's, you know about those L's? Listen and learn so we can love, live in Jesus so that you're not lame, so that you're not a loco, so that you're not lost, so that you're not loopy, so that you're not a loser, you know, like. But there's a lot of people that can spit Bible back to you and you go, man, I just don't like you. There's no courtesy to you at all. There's no graciousness. There's no kindness. There's no love. There's no patience. There's no joy. That's because there's no Jesus. They just know the Bible. That's a dangerous person because they have a form of godliness, but their life denies the power of it. They're whitewashed tombs, Jesus would have said. 
Looks good on the outside, but dead bones on the inside. The hardest people to reach are the religious and the rebellious. They're both hard. Does that make sense? That's the prodigal son dynamic. Prodigal son is more about the religious son than the rebellious. It's about both, but the audience was to the religious crowd. And this is where it's easy to fall into. Bro, I go to church. I even brought some macaroni and cheese on that third Sunday. Aren't I done? I mean, everyone's got their own journey with Jesus. But I do think this. You and I, God's always encouraging us to go further with him. Take that next step. What does that look like for you in your walk with Jesus? Maybe it's like getting into God's word for yourself, not just in a gathering, not just in a group, but as you're going. I'm going to start doing dwell. Does anyone know what dwell is? Like the Bible app that puts it in different dialects and different translations. You can have ambient music behind it and like you can be ready for the day. If you've got like a guy named Felix who's like got this South African accent and ambient music and you're just you know, you're ready to tackle the devil all day long because Felix is there with you preaching the Bible to you. Like, just get in the Bible. You have so many avenues to do that. Maybe that's your next step. Don't you wish there was a church that ever, no. Maybe that's your next step. Next Sunday, you'll hear a lot about small groups. Maybe that's your next step. Say, gosh, I'm not really in a community where I'm known. I love to come to the gathering and give and serve and learn. And, but grouping is also very much a part of your health. Gathering and grouping, I don't know where you are in your next step, but I am going to give us one this morning. It's called communion. Or we can come today as a, as a community of faith and celebrate the fact that Jesus died on the cross, he rose from the dead, gave us his Holy Spirit, ascended into heaven, and listen, he's coming again. 